How do you go from on top of the world? Twelves, they're bringing the trophy home. Your Seahawks, Super Bowl 48 champions. Second year quarterback, 28 victories now in his first two years, and including now a Super Bowl victory. To the laughing stock of an entire league. Some breaking news out of the NFL. The Broncos have informed Russell Wilson that he will be released after the start of the new league year. Well, for Russell Wilson, there seemingly was one man behind the scenes that ruined his career for good. But you see, his meteoric rise and tumultuous downfall was set long ago. So to understand what really happened to Russell Wilson, we have to start at the beginning. See, Russ wasn't always a star. In fact, growing up, he was the exact opposite. Coming out of high school, Wilson was a low-level two-star recruit who was the 67th best quarterback in his class, according to Scout.com. The two-star rating seemed to be a slap in the face, considering that he was a two-time All-State player who put up monster numbers during his junior and senior seasons. In his final two years at the collegiate school in Richmond, Virginia, Wilson amassed 6,296 yards passing and scored 74 touchdowns through the air. He was actually featured in Sports Illustrated for his performance in the state championship game win, and I think it's important to note for his eventual downfall that Wilson also served as senior class president. I want you to remember that. Now, outside of football, where Russ was a star was on the baseball diamond. See, after graduating from high school, Wilson was selected by the Baltimore Orioles as the fifth pick in the 41st round of the 2007 MLB draft. The Orioles considered Wilson a talent worthy of the first 10 rounds and offered him a $350,000 signing bonus the third largest they offered that year behind Jake Arrieta. Now, Russ would ultimately turn that down, but unfortunately for him, his eye-popping resume didn't really take him far. See, big-time collegiate programs, they were concerned about his height and multi-sport commitment issues at the next level. This, in turn, left only a few options on the table when it came down to selecting a school on National Signing Day. Only Duke and North Carolina State offered Wilson a scholarship. He ended up verbally committing to play football and baseball at NC State. The reason? Well, well, because head coach Chuck Amato allowed him to participate equally in both sports. Now, it is important to understand the impact that splitting time between sports can have on a player. Playing baseball means you are missing the spring season for a football team. In my opinion, as a college football player, this was the best time to find yourself as a player and really, most importantly, gel with your teammates. Those winter locker room sessions would truly make a man out of you. But Russ, he didn't get that chance because he was out on the baseball field. Now, fun fact here, Wilson never actually was given the opportunity to play under Chuck Amato. He was fired after the Wolfpack finished the 2006 season with a 3-9 record. Tom O'Brien was then named the new head coach just months later and went on to coach North Carolina State until the end of the 2012 season. So as a freshman in 2008, Russell Wilson actually flourished in O'Brien's West Coast offense. The 5'11 signal caller took care of the ball and led his team to a bowl game against Rutgers which he ended up exiting early with a knee sprain. He scored a touchdown, threw for 186, but NC State ended up losing that game due to the poor quarterback quality in the second half. However, Wilson's impressive stat line that earned him the starting spot easily for the next season. This is where Russ really transformed his game. He became a more accurate passer, became a better leader in the locker room somewhat, and set an impressive NCAA record. He became the first player in collegiate football history to throw 379 consecutive passes without throwing an interception. Yet, his outstanding play wasn't good enough to help the Wolfpack return to a bowl game for the second consecutive season. But they bounced back. In Wilson's junior year, he helped NC State's football program get back on the map. The team finished ranked 25 in the nation with a 9-4 record and a win over West Virginia in the Champ Sports Bowl. The third-year quarterback led the ACC in passing yards. He had 37 touchdowns. And the team was looking forward to having him back under center in 2011. Remember, he was a multi-sport athlete. He was playing baseball at NC State during this time. And when he was drafted in the fourth round by the Colorado Rockies, things changed. As a collegiate baseball player, Wilson had a point two seven batting average. He had five home runs, stole 17 bases, knocked in 30 runs. With numbers like that, his decision to skip his senior season was a bit strange. He wasn't the best out there, but nonetheless, he joined the Class A Tri-City Dust Devils during the spring and hit 230 while batting in 11 runs. After a short stint in that Northwest League, he joined the Asheville Tourists during the summer months of 2011, and Wilson, he did not perform well, like at all. He hit three home runs, and batted a measly 228. His underwhelming achievements during that short tour of duty in the minor leagues, and this time, 
made him reconsider of whether or not pro baseball was for him. Now at this point, Russ, he had lived the life of a pro, which in the grand scheme of things seems like it should have been a good thing, right? I mean, when Russ came back to football and headed up to Wisconsin, it sure as hell looked like a good thing. With the addition of Wilson, some hyped the Badgers up as the preseason national championship favorites. The senior quarterback wasn't able to secure that championship, but he did help Wisconsin get to the Big Ten Conference Championship and win it. Not to mention, the team finished 11-3 and and appeared in the Rose Bowl where they lost to Oregon. Even with his baseball stint, Russ had seemingly found himself to be a star. He was going to get drafted in the NFL. Baseball was behind him. He was on to new horizons. But that gap in football and never having an offseason with a college team, Russ still felt like he had to prove himself every step of the way. He wasn't a part of the social dynamic that the regular team was. Russ was much older than everybody on his college football team his senior year, and on the field, he may have been that leader, but in the real world, he was an outsider. For those who have never been in a football locker room, it sounds cliche, but it is truly a different experience. Everyone is going through the shared pain of a tough day on the field or a tough workout. In big time college programs, yeah, there are already some separation between team and quarterbacks on a daily basis, but in those off seasons, they are all one fighting for that same goal. Russell Wilson, he wasn't though. He was on the diamond. He was never truly one of those guys and he never truly understood those guys. And even though his success on the field was still imminent, this feeling of being an outsider would slowly begin his downfall. Now, at the NFL Scouting Combine, he crushed it. He ran a 4.55 40-yard dash. He mastered the three-cone drill, putting up 6.97. And in his 20-yard shuttle, he had an outstanding 4.09. No quarterback outperformed Wilson in those drills. Although many teams were very skeptical of his size, Seattle selected him with the 75th pick in the 2012 NFL Draft. When head coach Pete Carroll and general manager John Snyder first met Wilson, they both liked what they saw. Apparently, the GM John Snyder was so hot for Wilson that he wanted to select him in the second round. Schneider's fondness of the rookie quarterback helped put Russell Wilson in contention for the starting quarterback job. Carroll and Schneider both decided that an open quarterback competition was the right thing to do, even though they had just signed Matt Flynn to a three-year $26 million dollar deal. Remember Matt Flynn? What a weird time that was. Wilson's rise to the top of the death chart did not take long during training camp. After every preseason game, he inched closer and closer. Then on August 26, 2012, Carroll bucked all conventional wisdom and named the rookie quarterback their week one starter. And we all know how it went. Russ was electric in Seattle. In year two, Russ alongside the Legion of Boom would win a Super Bowl, making Russ the shortest quarterback ever to get that honor. But life was good. He would be back there again, and yeah, he'd throw that interception to Malcolm Butler, but Russ was still on top of the league and a perennial pro bowler. Things couldn't be better in Seattle. Off the field, though, signs began to show things just weren't adding up. I want to preface this next part by making everyone aware I think Russ is an incredible guy with great values, and he's a great father, husband, and family man. None of what I'm about to say is an attack on his character, but just strictly an observation about how football is a whole different world, especially in a locker room. With that said, Russ, he may have been crushing it on the field, but the things he was saying outside were just so odd. In 2014, reports surfaced of his Seahawks teammates not completely just yelling with their new signal caller. Now these were quickly quieted by the Seahawks, but interesting to see now. Allegedly, former Seahawks receiver Percy Harvin and other Seahawks players believed that Wilson quote unquote, wasn't black enough. Bleacher Report had even put out an article reading, players said Harvin was an accelerant in a locker room that was quickly dividing between Wilson and anti-Wilson. There's also an element of race that needs to be discussed. Feelings on this and is backed up by several interviews with Seahawks players is that some black players in the locker room think Wilson isn't black enough. The main issue some players seem to have with Wilson is they think he's too close to the front office, which is the same ridiculous thing somebody said about McNabb. How could anybody have a problem? Problem with Wilson, he's one of the best players in the sport, is one of the best citizens, is unfathomable to me, but that's the case. Now, this was really the last we heard of all this. All of this was swept out by the Seahawks because they continued to dominate, but you could tell the locker room was slowly falling out of love with Russell Wilson. See, Russ had related more to that front office than to his own team. This was just a job for Russ. He had been a professional for more than five years at this point, even though he'd only been in the league for a few. Like I said before, the locker room was a foreign place to Russell Wilson and his teammates. They felt that. According to former Seahawks teammate Richard Sherman, 
Russ wasn't even a friend. Prior to playing Russ for the first time after he was sent to the 49ers, Richards said that he was looking forward to seeing some old faces. However, he indicated that Wilson wasn't among the former teammates and coaches he kept up with. Sherman said, I don't really have a relationship with Russell. We were teammates. We played through a very special time for the franchise. It was a good time for the team. It was a good time for the organization. They didn't handle some things like I felt like they should have, and other guys felt the same way. Marshawn Lynch, who played alongside Wilson in the Seahawks backfield from 2010 to 2015 and was an absolutely massive contributor to Russ's success, said this. I wouldn't be the, the right person to, to speak on their relationship because I didn't, like, I didn't, I didn't fuck with him. With Pete, uh -huh. and then, I mean, you know, Russ was, like, just a quarterback for me. Right. You know what I mean? So it wasn't as... You didn't have no kind of a relationship? Y'all didn't, didn't, like, go to a go to a party? Y'all didn't get together doing it? Y'all didn't kick it like that? I mean, even Seven. I mean, Seven would come to the room. Club Shay, you know, Club Shay Shay started in, like, a training camp in Denver. John would come to the room. We drank beer. We played cards. We rolled dice. The guys played video games. We laugh and shoot the ish. We had that type of relationship with him. Well, I'm... Y'all... So the thing is, I mean, you know, to go, there's nothing. I, like I, I respect Russell as you know, feel me as a player and as a teammate. Mm -hmm. You know, anything that I say, you feel me, because of the situation. You know, throwing the pick on the goal line, not giving me the ball, this, that, and the third. Him, you know, leaving from Seattle, you know, going over to anything that I say is gonna come off as you know malice or as if you know a hater or right. because I mean, you know what I. You know, I'll, I'll take Russ and I'll put him right there at quarterback and I'll rock with him right. because I have done that. Right. But I mean, you know, as far as anything else, it's like there's y'all no, didn't have a relationship outside of football. No, nah, there's no I mean, it can't right. pick up the phone and, and call old right. boy or nothing. And then, I mean, you know, what you mean you couldn't pick up the phone? I mean. I, you, I don't got his number. Oh. Marshawn went on to explain that you would have to go through his manager to talk to him. And when he'd call you, it was from block number. Another story Lynch told was one of an incident at a Seahawks practice that centered around accountability. After practice, Lynch said Carroll gathered him and some of the other team's leaders who apparently had an issue with Wilson that day. Carroll told the players not to talk to Wilson directly about their concerns and anytime they had an issue with how the quarterback was leading the team, they should speak to Carroll first. At this point, Russell was basically an extension of the front office, being protected by the front office. Then starts all this madness on social media with, with the weird Instagram videos. This is where Mr. Unlimited was sadly born. Hey guys, Russell here. Yes, the typical boring robot Russell, the one you guys love to know, a real, real exciting. Everybody has to have an alter ego, right? And I've been thinking about what my alter ego would be, and I, I think I have an alter ego. His name's Mr. 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 Unlimited. Yeah, you, know, you gotta be unlimited. You know, you gotta have a thought process of being unlimited. So when people ask you what you're thinking about or what you wanna do in life or where you wanna go, you gotta be unlimited. Tell them I'm unlimited. You know what I mean? So when they ask you certain questions like, Brings you motivation, Russell. Mr. Unlimited. Who, who's your role model, Russell? Unlimited. Who's your go-to person for advice, Russell? They think Pete Carroll, they think this person, think that person. Love you, Pete, but it's Mr. Unlimited. And who could forget the most awkward Subway ad of all time? Which is crazy, because they had Jared Fogle. Hmm. Hey, you wanna uh, split this Subway sandwich? It is my signature sandwich. It's called the Danger Witch, and it's dangerously good. Be careful though, it's spicy. You ever done anything dangerous? Hmm, jeez, that is dangerous. I've done something like that too. I won't tell anybody. Listen, one time, ugh, Never mind. that's too dangerous. Anyways, my danger witch, it's only in the vault. That's our little secret. Everything had just gotten so weird for Russ. Everything he was doing, everything he was saying, it was just strange. So fast forward to 2022. Wilson was acquired by the Broncos from the Seahawks for two first round picks, two second round picks, a fifth round pick, tight end Noah Font, D lineman Shelby Harris, and QB Drew Locke. The Broncos only got a fourth round back on top of Wilson. At the time, many questioned the Seahawks. How could they let a generational quarterback walk away? But really, this was all the plan. See, they had squeezed as much solid play out of Russ as they possibly Possibly could without the team just exploding. And right when they hit their breaking point, they parted ways. The Seahawks and Pete Carroll, they knew it was coming. Their front office shielded Russ from the world since day one. Remember just a few minutes ago when I had said, apparently the GM John Snyder was so hot for Wilson that he wanted to select him in the second round. Well, that weird liking of Russ that Schneider had, it followed. See, Pete Carroll, 
He's a football guy. He didn't want to have to be the riot shield for Russell Wilson, but when you got a rookie QB in their first few seasons, a head coach has to be. And this worked. They won a Super Bowl in year two. GM John Snyder saw that this worked and made sure if Pete wanted to keep his job, Russ would be able to live as that outsider. See, that's why Russ was so close with the front office. That's why management was okay with Russ not being a real member of the team or hanging out with his teammates. The GM loved Russ. Russ gave him legitimacy. That was his guy. They won a Super Bowl doing that. They knew it could work. But as Russ grew more and more exiled from the team, even Schneider realized he couldn't erase what they had created. So they shipped him off and found success in a new underdog, Geno Smith. Now onto the Broncos, things remained the same for Russ when he got there. They granted Wilson an office on the second floor of the team facility while all other players congregated in the locker room somewhere else. The situation for Wilson, who did not have an office when he played for the Seattle Seahawks, reportedly created an unusual dynamic within the team. One Denver player even shared how Wilson told his teammates that he had a quote unquote open door policy. Is he a professor? Like to no surprise, this rubbed others wrong in the organization. Broncos players questioned, is this guy a teammate or a coach? Russ was losing touch with the reality of being a player. You look at great veteran quarterbacks like Matthew Stafford, for example. They are all still in the locker room. Matt had breakfast with rookie Puka Nakua every day this season in order to build a connection. That's just not Russ. And when old Sean Payton came into town, oh boy, was Russ in for a rude awakening. This guy seemed to be out for Russ from day one. He took away that office immediately and wanted to make Russ a part of the team. But he knew. He knew from the minute he walked in. That would never work. Russ was already far too gone. So when you look back at what caused the fall off of Russell Wilson, at the end of the day, it was all because of one man. You could say GM John Snyder, but no, it was Russ himself. He became too separated from the reality of being a football player. This stemmed from him truly never being one of the guys in college, always toting the line of baseball and football. He has always been an outsider. The Seahawks, they learned to protect that and use it to their advantage. But the Broncos, like the rest of us, had no idea what was truly going on. Now again, I think Russ is a great guy and he will find a new home. And I hope that he learns from his past. But sadly, I believe he'll never be a locker room fan fit no matter how great he is on the field and whether you like it or not we may never get to see russ cook again i'm all hail cohen and if you enjoyed this video make sure you hit like and subscribe it really helps push our videos and support what we're doing also go down and comment let him cook want to see how many people got this far we're dropping new documentaries just like this one weekly so let us know which topic you'd like to see next and until then peace